Hello, and welcome to another episode of Dealer Talk. Today's guest is awesome. So I had the privilege of listening to this person speak recently at an auto um, show conference, and man, it was amazing. Um, I've, uh, Eric and myself have a relationship with this person on LinkedIn. Um, we're super pumped about um, having him on the show. Love his content. So I'm just super, super excited to um, start the conversation uh, and see where things go. Eric, what's up, dude? How you doing? Oh, man. Fantastic. Let me tell you something. The, 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 uh, what you're talking about, the, the, the gentleman coming on board today is... I don't know that you went ahead and hyped it up enough. I mean, this dude really <laughs> resonates with passion. This guy is all about, well, it, you know, when, when you meet somebody that absolutely is bought into whatever it is they're saying, and they, they know it backwards, forwards, upside down, whatever, um, I'm always drawn into that type of a, an individual. I think that today, for today's purposes, we're going to have a ball, bro. Let's get the show rolling. Rolling. Yeah, man, for sure. So um, I have a question. Um, one one process, uh, uh, you know, in the dealership that I've been thinking about a lot, uh, you know, and been wanting to have a conversation about it on the show has been the trade-in process. Um, and I think that that's changed significantly, especially because of technology, right? We have a lot of tools and widgets that are supposedly designed to make the, the process better, a better experience for the consumer, for the consumer, excuse me, more profitable for, for, for the dealership. Um, at your store, are you guys using anything um, or do you still do it, you know, quote unquote, the old way or like what, what's it like over at your store, dude? Uh, well, we still require for the, the salespeople to walk outside and actually physically tr- touch the, the customer's training because, you know, the, the psychology of, of touching the, the scratches and the slight dance and whatnot, not saying a word, just touching those things, um, it still works. I mean, people have done already, they're, they're educated walking in the door, um, knowing full well what they're expecting for their for their vehicle when you, you know, you can do those non verbal communications by touching these things and pointing out the flaws and whatever the value does still tend to go down in the customer's mind so um and you know that, that we're fighting we're, we're scrapping we're scraping for for profits these days and so any kind of tactical advantage this is chess it's not checkers <laughs> so any kind, any kind of advantage we can we can uh, acquire on our side is is a win so uh, that's that's our process you know we have um, we use uh, VIN Connect, which allows my sales to go out there and, and uh, scan the VIN and put it directly into our, um, our system, our automated system. Um, and we can work out with our VIN, uh, VIN system, I should say. So um, that's you, you still have to do those those things that still work. You know, the, the quote-unquote, the foundational things still apply. So we can't get out of Even in today's high-tech world, we still have to do those things that, that matters. So that's hopefully that answer your question. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's what, that's one of the reasons, you know, I wanted to kind of set it up because the, the, the guest of today um, was in the automotive industry for many years. Um, you know, uh, I may be misquoting here, but I think 20 years plus on the retail side, then um, made, made a switch and, and, and started his, his own company and, and is focused, uh, you know, I think, on his profile on LinkedIn, it says something to the effect of the sole purpose is to um, make sure that there's no overspend at the dealerships on the marketing side. And I don't know. I think the trade and process is one of those areas that I don't know. It's, it's evolved, and you know the technology is there, but I don't know. You know, I'm just excited to have the conversation with our guest to see what what his take is on this. So, without further ado, let me just introduce this person again. This um, been in the in the automotive on the retail side twenty plus years. Um, I believe has his own business, working with multiple dealerships. Um, have the pleasure to introduce our guest for today, Mr. Sean Welsh. Sean, what's up, dude? Gentlemen, thank you so much. This is awesome. I'm, uh, I'm really glad to be here, dude. So excited to have you on the show. I know we we were trying to do this last year, and and you know it didn't work out. But um, you know, super super excited to have you on with us today. Can you just uh, for the listeners give us a little bit of your of your recap? Did I get that right? Was it twenty plus years on the retail side? 
Well, I no, it's 20 plus years in the business. Um, I'm 37 years old and I started when I was 17 detailing cars. And then from there, just pretty much grew up in the business. Um, I've either been selling cars or, or, or suits my whole life, man. That's been my, those have been my two jobs. And uh, the car business has been one that's just been absolutely phenomenal for me uh, and my family for it, you know, for, for as long as I've been in it. So I'm really glad to be sitting down with you guys. I'm glad we made it work. And uh, I think officially this is my first podcast that I've been on. Obviously, I have my own, but this is the first one I think that I've been on. So again, thank you so much. Nice. Oh That's God. awesome, man. Oh, cool. <laughs> All right. So uh, before we kind of no, no, before we kind of get into the conversation, can you talk to us a little bit about um, about your current company? Love, yeah, absolutely, man. Love to. So Car Biz Done Better um, was kind of a an idea hatched out of another idea. Basically, um, m- my wife and I were starting to kind of decide which way we were going to go with our lives. And I've always wanted to have my name out front of a dealership. Uh, it's always been my goal. And so in talking with her and talking with a few other people, and, and it, it was just starting to really kind of come to fruition, had an opportunity here in Wisconsin to uh, partner up and really get involved in a store. And so I sat down with someone that uh, I really really respect in the industry up in Madison, Wisconsin, the owner of uh, 17 stores. And uh, he basically said to me in so many words, Sean, you know, uh, I think you could do great at running a store, owning a store, but then you'd only be helping one store. Um, I think your knowledge is, is deeper and bigger than that. I think you can help many stores. So I'd like you to start your own company and start, I'll give you, you know, three of my stores uh, for uh, 3000 bucks for 90 days is what he guaranteed me. Um, and so initially when someone says that the last time I made $3,000 in a month, I was 18 years old. So that was, uh, it was a little bit jarring to, to take the idea with it. But um, it, talking with my wife, who's definitely, if you guys have listened to my show or, or listened to me talk at all, my wife is a huge part of what I do. Um, and she said, let's just go for it. You know, let's, let's start this company. Let's give it a shot. Um, so we, uh, we enlisted a, a good friend of ours that I've known since I was 13 years old as our uh, director of operations. And uh, we hit the ground running with that account. And within uh, six months, we had all 17 stores and had worked out some, you know, fair pricing and, and had other clients that I'd worked with in the past come on board. And the next thing you know, uh, geez, this year we celebrated, uh, this would be our five year anniversary. So it was a, it was a pretty big milestone for us. And, uh, our company is solely focused as you said, in, in helping dealers deal with digital marketing, period. The whole job is to make sure no one gets it taken advantage of. Um, my only dog in this fight is the dealer's money. In today's world, the dealer's money is is most important. It needs to go the furthest. Um, I think there's this idea that there's endless pockets of cash at dealerships. That is not true. Um, there, some It's true for some, but for most, not true. So um, it's uh, the company is really about making sure that the dealers understand everything about their spend. Um, we do not have affiliations with OEMs. We cannot be bought off by vendors. We are not in that business. We are only in the business of data and, and dealership money. So that's uh, that's what the company is. It's, it's growing uh, every day. And, and people are coming to me with new ideas and want me to evolve the company and try and help them with other things because the brand is very trusted. So that's something we're looking forward to to uh, to do in 2019. But as of right now, it's just a digital, digital marketing company that helps deal with digital marketing. We don't sell it. I don't, I don't offer you anything. But again, the service of, of looking into your data and tracking down your money. Yeah. Okay, so listen, I, I mean, this is your first podcast. I mean, and, and so I, if anything else... I, I want you to. I want your best effort today. Meaning that <laughs> I want. I want the, the most amount of knowledge you can give within the the thirty to forty minutes that we're allotted here. Okay, so I want. I'm looking for your best effort. I'm looking for somebody to be able to tie into this specific podcast and go. Oh my gosh, I, I learned something so valuable. So that's exactly. I just want to go. Go. I want to make sure I'm setting the bar up correctly. Here, here's a deal. Here's a deal. My question is this: um, When you say you know car biz done better, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, what makes you different as compared to everybody else? What is your what's your theme, bro? What is it that you do better than anybody else? I want to know that. 
All right. Well, I'll put I'll put it to you this way. Um, we created the market that we currently reside in. So we're, what we do is we deal with the the absolute product name is vendor management, right? And the vendor management part of it is something we created. It was a niche market five years ago. No one has done it. Um, and so what we do and how we deliver is like nobody else. I deliver all of my information via HD on demand video for my clients at every moment. I allow them complete access to me and my team. I pick up the phone at customer support, not some 22-year-old who has no idea what they're talking about. I'm the one dissecting the budget each and every month. I'm the one doing the audio. And people say, well, Sean, how can you keep up with that? Because me and my team are so organized. We have this whole thing down to such a science that it doesn't take the effort you think it does. Um, as a matter of fact, lately, people have been coming to me thinking my company is gigantic. Uh, I've had multiple requests through LinkedIn to say, hey, Sean, your company, a company your size must take on interns. That's laughable, dude. I don't take on overhead for nothing. Okay, I run this thing as lean as possible so that I can keep adding all the value back to my client. We don't have offices. We don't have, uh, you know, fancy cars that we all drive. We are just we are trying to just tie down and make sure we dive into data. What sets me apart is I've done the job. Okay, I've been on my way to ownership. I've been an Internet director of multiple stores. I've been in this data. I do it every day. One of the biggest things I hear from people that aren't into what we do, right? They're like, well, you know, it's all snake oil. And even if it wasn't, you know, I have an internet manager and you're not going to take his job. Let me be frankly honest with you guys. Um, If I wanted someone's job in this industry, I'll go take it. Okay. I'm overqualified for most jobs. It's a matter of want. I don't want anybody's job. I want to help to support people. You see, everyone else is in it for the big money grab. We're not. This company will not be sold. This company will not outgrow its support. These are the pillars at which we run our business. And nobody, and I'm telling you right now, there's no one that delivers as consistently as I have. As a matter of fact, we are in year five. We have never missed a client delivery date. Every client has their data in their inbox previous to the 12th of every single month for five years running. We started with three clients. We're up to 40. This is because of organization. This is because of care. So if you want to be different, you got to go out and make the difference, right? It isn't about words. It's about action. So if you talk to my clients, which I got a 90% retention, that alone should be enough for people. But let's say it wasn't. Let's say you talk to my client. What would you find? You find I'm there when you need me and in the background when you don't. Okay, I'm not blowing you up for two hour meetings a month. I'm not showing up to your dealership, bothering you, trying to buy you donuts, make you happy. It's none of that. It's simply delivering on the message and being who you expect me to be each and every month. Yes, it is boring. There's not a lot of sexiness to data. But what there is is excitement when you uncover an issue, when you see a waste in spend, when you sign a new client, all of a sudden you save them $20,000 a month. You're talking quarter million dollars. Now they can go out and invest in their people. They can go out and invest in their service department. They can change their own lives, okay? I'm not here to change the car business. Um, I'm smarter than that. I think that's kind of a crazy little errand to take on. What I am here to change is those who want to do better, spend less, and be a part of something that's going to be exciting for the long term. We try to stay on the cutting edge. I joked with someone the other day. People tell me I'm ahead of the curve. It turns out I am the curve. Okay, everything we talk about and see, I see in the future. I don't know how it happens, but I love this industry this much. I invest all my time in it that I see things coming. And and, and you guys are talking about trade-ins, right? There's so much in that deal that I think people need to be talking about. So it's uh, what sets me apart. Um, it's, it's, it's not an answer that's acceptable to people who are investors, but it is. It's me and my team. We cannot be duplicated, period. I love that. <laughs> Hey, what is your, uh, you know, with uh, the conversion, that everything seems to be driven towards AI. What's your, what's your, what's your impression? What's your, what is your thoughts on AI as a, as it, you know, infiltrates and coming into the auto industry? What do you, what do you think of the, the AI? What do you think of that? I mean, you know, I think it has its place. I think I've been a very, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I, let's see what the word would be. I guess I, I guess I've been opposed to AI for a very long time. Um, AI to me has twofold. One, it's coming into the marketing side. Um, if it comes into the marketing side, all it should do is lower the cost. If you're going to pay robots and not humans to do a job, then I'm not going to I'm not going to pay you as much. You see, I pay for the human element. So if advertisers are going to brag about how they've got it figured out, AI is the man. Then the, then the cost of doing business should be going down. Um, the other side of AI is in dealerships um, at the at the follow up level, and I've been a huge a huge hater 
on the whole idea. Honestly, it was like, look, if you don't have enough people, staff up. If you have too many leads, get rid of your garbage leads. Um, but the reality is the AI now is, is, is so developed that it can certainly be helpful. I don't think you can live on it. Um, at all. I think it's I think I think it's certainly a crutch that can help you do better when you're overwhelmed. There are certain stores today that I would say to you, look, that, that if you've got, you know, if you've got 500 leads and one BDC agent, go get yourself some AI. Right. Um, there's a way to do that. I don't even know that outsource BDCs are as helpful as AI can be from a cost perspective. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a big company out there, Conversica, uh, my boy Ramsey that I talk to on LinkedIn all the time. You know, he's done a good job of really kind of showing me the other side and, and having me have an open mind. But um, let's see, this would have been earlier this year, geez, because we're in December. Earlier this year, I had back-to-back podcasts, one with Sean Kelly uh, and one with my boy Chad Graves from Reunion Marketing that were about this very topic and how robots are coming in and Sean thinks they're going to take over the sales world and Chad thinks they're going to take over marketing. Um, and, you know, it's fine. I think people overuse it. I think it's a buzzword. And if you've ever listened to me talk, I, I hate buzzwords. I try to avoid them at all costs. I think they're unhealthy. But um, it's it's one of those that's out there. It's a part of our business. It's part of the evolution. Um, it, it's part of what can help. Hey, you talk about the trading process, right? Um, in the trading process, now they're starting to have AI. Uh, I met a company from Canada at the uh, digital dealer that I was just at down in Vegas. That's basically going to try and set up an app that you'll walk it. You'll just walk it around your car, and it'll take all the pictures and send them right back to the dealership, right? And it'll it'll highlight dents, it'll highlight scratches, it'll get into all these things. So I think the evolution of technology is important, um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't get hung up on it. And I, I don't yet think that AI is here to you know basically turn us into Terminator and uh, and put us out of business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that there's some there. There's, um, I don't know. It's an interesting time, right? There's, there's. I, I, my personal opinion is, I think that there's room for some of that within the automotive industry, but you know, for me, coming from service, like that's that's a hard one because, um, you know, I just I'm 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 a proponent of the personal touch. I think that you know, and especially in the industry, right? We talk about experience. And I think I said this on the show on other episodes, but oh, it's the experience. But when it, but nobody really, you know, is really doing anything when it comes to that to really generate that experience in a way that you know that we can talk about specifics. You know, we all mentioned. Oh, Herb, I agree, Matt. I think a lot of people have missed the boat on that. You know, as a matter of fact, that's what I'm prepping for all of the, uh, you know, I'm trying to submit out a couple of things for speaking engagement this year to digital dealer and upcoming events. And and that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about, man, is, you know, uh, is, is, is customer service. Like, where are we at with this? Why have we lost our way so much that we've become just so involved in the technology aspect of it that we've forgotten this whole thing is about customer service, period. Um, it's, it's not going to change. And, and I don't think AI fits into the service world at all, um, except for obviously, no, I don't think it does at all because you don't have long-term follow-up. You have declined services that are fairly, that, that turnaround is fairly quick. It's not like people take four months to decide. They're either in or they're out in most cases. So yeah, I, I think I think AI has a place in our business. It certainly isn't at the front and it certainly isn't, as I said, going to be the, the overwhelming majority of what goes on. I agree, man. So, um, all right. So to kind of bring it back to, to the beginning, right? Like I, I really wanted to kind of um, you know, I was excited, obviously, to have you on the show. Uh, but one of the areas that I, I, I kind of wanted to pick your brain on was the trading process, right? Because I think that, um, you know, there's technology that really has evolved that. Um, but I see a lot of dealers uh, getting the widgets and, 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 and that whole deal, but I don't see the implementation, um, you know. So what's your take on that? I mean, are you are you – a fan of some of the, the the changes, or do you still think that the quote unquote old way is is, is the best way? No, I think it's a, I think it's a blend. You know, listen to Eric uh, before I came on. Listen to Eric talk about it. You know, it, it gives me uh, it, it gives me kind of the the remembrance of what it was like. You know, the silent walk around was key. You know, it was key to life, right? You come in, you have this car. People obviously love it. One of the first things I looked for when I walked out to a trade was was it clean. Right. Because if it was clean, today's the day. Right. This car is not going back in the garage. They didn't put seven dollars in the machine to wash this thing to go back home. Right. 
this thing's getting traded in. And even more so back when I started, we're talking 98, um, 99 in sales, 98, 99 in sales, man, there were stacks of magazines and newspapers in the front seat, okay? That, that you knew where they were going. You knew what they were looking at. They circled it with marker, right? If you just paid attention to your surroundings, you could see so much more um, that was what was really there. So um, let me talk about what, what I did. When I did silent walk rounds, I did exactly what Eric did. I'd just run my finger over the tires. I'd find a scratch and I, I'd kind of ooh and ah, but quietly, right? And I would just stay in my notepad. Um, what I do love about today's technology is, as Eric put it, this, the, the VIN scanner, okay? Uh, I have terrible penmanship, so I got yelled at all the time as a young salesman about Sean. Dude, learn how to write. What is this VIN? Is that an M? Is it an N? Is that What is this? One L? Like, what are you doing? Um, so that I can really appreciate making the job go better. Um, but the, 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 the one thing that I set apart, as soon as I started dealing with quote unquote internet leads, right? That were being faxed to me back in 1999. When I was dealing with those, one of the first things that stood out was going to have to be the ease of access because there was a reason these people didn't come to the dealership before they gave me their information via fax, right? There had to have been a reason. This can't just be because. So I started to think it had to do with ease of access. So what I started right away was developing a, a, a basically one in five system for your windshield, your tires, your interior, your exterior. And I did that both via email and actual phone call. And it would just be a quick little, okay, great. Let me see if I can get you an idea of what that car might be worth. And, and when you're talking early 2000s, going up to the desk, asking for you know sight unseen trade appraisals, you are not a popular guy, all right? You're, you're someone who people look at and go, this guy's out of his mind. Get him out of my office. Eric's laughing because he knows right now if I walked in his office in 2003, he'd have thrown me right back out of my ass. Um, and I get it. And I, 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 I totally understand. But this is what I'm talking about being ahead of the curve, right? Seeing this industry from a totally different perspective, this is an important part of it. So ease of access was number one for me. And that started to be uh, something that set me apart from my competition. Because here, guys, let's be honest. This is not a penny close situation, right? So when you give a customer a range on a trade-in, I'm saying, folks, your car can be worth anywhere from five to $10,000. The first thing I would hear is, Sean, boy, that is a lot of money. Can you narrow it down? Sure. When can you be here? Let my manager take a look at your car. I've got time today or tomorrow. Boom. Done. Now we've given the customer a range. Let's say he stops at Joe Schmo Automotive before he gets to Sean's dealership. Joe Schmo tells him his car is worth five grand. Guess what he remembers Sean telling him his car was worth? Ten grand. Sean didn't say that. Sean said anywhere from five to ten, right? Up to as much as, but he heard 10. So now he's blowing off Joe Schmo going, well, let me get to Sean. Sean's saying, well, hey, man, you've been to other places. What have they been telling you? Oh, I've been here in five, six grand. If we get that guy to seven, we're a car deal all day long. So it's about understanding the value of that trade, what it means to the human being, because today's consumer, I love them, but you know, their math can be a little wonky. Just because you owe 20 grand on your 08 Civic, don't make your 08 Civic worth 20 grand. Right. This is this becomes math, hard math. Um, and so but you've got to be instead of being a jag off, instead of being rude to people about it. Why don't you sit down and educate them on exactly what's happened, on exactly why we're here and why exactly after today, it's only going to get worse. This is the depreciating asset. Today is its best value. And, and even more so today. Like I, I know I sound so old when I say this, but. Kids today in the car business, you guys got CRMs, you got VIN scanners, you got market reports. If you walk out to a customer unprepared, that shit's on you. I can't help you with that. Like you need to be as prepared as your customer because they know they're ready to go. So treat them with the respect and time they deserve and, and show them how you got here. And if you all don't agree, then that's fine. But if you take the time to show them, that's all that you can do. My father told me at a very young age, as long as you can look in the mirror, and tell yourself that you did all you could do, then the day is, a, is, is, is complete. You've done it. And, and that's how I feel about each and every car deal. I took it really seriously. I was the first one to build out online uh, trade appraisals. Okay, This is back in 2002 um, with a company called Dealer Skins. Anyone who has been in the car business long enough will know. Shout out to my boy, Jesse Forbes, who I've known all that time. I uh, used to work for the company Dealer Skins back in the day. Um, but these are the sort of things that, that we were paying attention to. We were, the first, we were the first people to approach that same company and ask them for credit card um, d deposit areas on our website that were AAA secure. So customers could go give credit card information because we negotiated deals over the phone online because we're not afraid. 
because we know we're going to take the same steps to the sale as we would if you were in front of us, but we get that you don't want to be in front of us. So I would tell people to to do be open, especially today. Guys, what is it, 2018? Get ready to be 2019. And we're going to tell customers their best leverage to be in person. Stop it. Stop it. It's not their best leverage. Their best leverage is to listen to you, guide them through the process. That's the leverage. Do you think that there's that – there's, um... Uh, man, how do I how do I put this? Okay, so um, you know, within your what, what you do for dealerships, do you see some some you know? Do you think that these widgets, these tools, are are? I don't want to say worth the the value, but I mean, do you think that they're the that? Yeah, I mean, that's the question. You know, do you think that is the question, Herb? Herb, here's the thing, right? Um, how much do you, Herb? Are you aware of what these widgets cost? To let me set some context here. Yeah, you know, my background. I used to work for one of the bigger companies in the automotive industry, and so I, you know, we had our own deal. And yeah, so right. So these things now that the prices come down a little bit, right? The price is three ninety nine, two ninety nine, four ninety nine, somewhere in there. Um, and do I see value? Yeah. Um, how do you utilize the tool? What is the point of it? Are you sending it out uh, in all of your emails? Is it just a widget on your website? Do you have it overtaking your banners? Like, there's so much to know about it, but the conversion data is easy to know. Okay, if you have a Google Analytics account, and if you don't, stop spending money online and go get yourself one. It's absolutely absurd to think that you don't. Um, but let's, so let's assume you have one, you can set up a goal for that widget. So now what you can see is what traffic does when it gets there, how often it converts. I've got some tools right now that are converting over one and a half percent. I think anytime you can get 1% of conversion is good. However, it's amazing how far we've fallen, right? When I started in the car business, if, if you didn't have a, a a sell rate of all of your opportunities at 50% or better, you were garbage. Now in marketing, we've taken it down to 0.05%, 1% of something. So it's it's pretty amazing how much we've changed how we look at data. But um, there's there's value to, the, to those tools if used correctly. Um, and I'm finding more and more, though, that consumers want to have name recognition. Um, so a great tool that I love using is my boys trade pending out of Seattle, Washington. These guys are awesome. They are really, really awesome. I apologize for all the name dropping guys. I just happen to know all these guys. And so if they're cool, I like bringing them up. So if that, if that gets annoying, just let me know and I'll do my best to stop. But um, no, this, this company it doesn't, it doesn't bro. Keep beating us going. Okay. All right, good. So this company allows you to really get involved in the trade process and they make it so super quick. That's what I would tell people. Do not have, envision it like a full credit app versus a five liner. You do not need a full on vehicle history from the customer. Stop asking for that. Get it narrowed down. Get to the highlights so that everyone can move through this process. Yes, if you have if you have agents who can uh, communicate with customers via text and text pictures, now we're next level. I did not have that. I had simply the trust of the customer with the agreeance that if I showed up to your house and your car was not as you described, the deal can and will change at that moment. And and and, and it rarely did it because people were being honest because they wanted to save their time. So um, I believe in widgets. I, I believe as, as everything else that it's not the end all be all. It will not save your life. Um, you have to use it. Any tool we talk about, any widget we talk about, you have to to use it to see the true value of it. So that's what I sit back and wait on. That's why I watch it because I see all these different tools. Some convert better than other. Some have name recognition like KBB Edmonds. Those tools are starting to do a little bit better than they were in the past. A, because those companies have finally quit having full 25 questions to ask. They've all shortened the process. But more importantly, people have, consumers have name recognition. And that's what we must remember about all of this. It's not about what you like on your website or what you think is cool. It's about what the consumer is going to use. Do you think uh, at the dealership level, the, you know, the expectation is, uh, you know, of um, results is set correctly? And what I mean by that is, you know, for me, when somebody, you know, that person, you know, obviously the dealer wants leads, right? But that person that, you know, is looking at trade, to me, they're they're early in the process, right? So, um, you know, or early in the purchasing decision journey, um, you know, so it could, I, you know, from my experience, they generate a lot of leads, but the quality or the conversion seems to be on the lower side, right? So, well, I think... I- I think that's because I, I think that's because of as you said, I think it's because of process, man. I don't know. No, to answer your question, no, the expectation is not set correctly at a dealership level. 
It just isn't. Um, and that goes across the board with all the leads that dealerships get. Dealerships don't have, um, most of them don't have specific approaches for these leads. And, and you said it's higher funnel. Uh, I, I'm going to debate you on that fact because I believe that if, if handled correctly, that's the lowest funnel opportunity you got. Because if you trade, if you look at these trading tools correctly, and you have a customer giving you all of his information for his car and he wants a value, why does he want a value? Why, what, what is he looking to do? He's looking to get rid of his car. Well, what if, what if you just approached him to take his car off his hands and didn't try to sell him a car? Right, right, yeah. Think about it. Think about it. if you call that guy and yeah. you say, hey, Mr. Jones, I just want your car. When can you be here? Well, uh, hold on a second. If you want my car, I've got to buy a car. Now we're talking. I'm telling you right now, I think that customer is more prepared to do business if you knew how to talk to him and knew how to handle it. Right. No, I, I totally agree with that. All right. It's a process thing. But, you know, like I said, it's just when it comes to the lead, you know, when it comes to being a lead, you know what I mean? Is it is the expectation set up correctly, you think, at that level? But um, I agree with you. Right? No, Herb. I don't think I don't think any of these guys set up their leads correctly as far as how they view them. I don't think we look at I don't think we look at funnels anymore. I think we just say a lead is a lead and let's put it in. If I get so many leads, then I'll be fine. Um, and this is no longer a quantity game, man. This is a quality game. This is how you will succeed in the long term. It is why I take and go through the budgets the way I do and make sure my customers understand that, guys, I'm going to shave a bunch of money off the budget, not so that I can spend it somewhere else, so that I can prove to you it doesn't have to be on here in the first place. And it only takes six months. Yeah, those first three months, man, can guys get scared. Guys call me, oh my God, Sean. Oh my God, things are falling apart. What are we going to do? They're not, those two are not mutually exclusive, okay? Most dealerships, Herb and Eric, you know this, do not have a lead problem. They have a selling and process problem. As a matter of fact, I come across less than 5% of stores that actually have a lead problem. And, and, and that's, that's part of the issue is you don't know what's wrong with you, so you go to fix what you think is the easiest, and it ends up being not what's broken in the first place. No, I, I, think, I think you get the nail on the head here because I think when we, <laughs> from a dealership standpoint, when we are... When we get the leads, I mean, some of us are more appreciative than others, but but for the most part, we just treat it as the up on the lot. They say they're going to leave. Okay, let them leave. I mean, we don't really know how to, to best fit them back into um, into our store. We don't know how to put fit them into our process. We don't know where to where to stick them into into us and how to make them count for us and how to keep contact with. So, I mean, what you're saying is right on point, obviously. Um, what, what would you say is the best practice for dealerships online today? What is the best? What do you mean, ultimately, in order to get the best bang for the buck, how do they capitalize on the best practice for, for dealerships today? Make sure that you invest in yourself first. Look at your budget. Look at your digital budget as a whole. And if you look at your digital budget, and better than 85% of your money is committed to other people. So that's that's what I refer to as the big three, auto trader, car gurus, cars.com. Um, that, that, that is an issue for me. And it's only an issue for me because of the where you compete. Um, and I find it easier to have a lower funnel customer to higher quality on my website. Now, there's a lot of debate about how to get them there, etc. And this, this is not the show for that. Um, but I will tell you that look at your budget from the inside out. Make sure that your your building, right? Your website is your building, right? Eric, would you would you allow your sales staff to start a Saturday with your cars parked sideways, uh, your 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 front grass overgrown by two and a half feet? No way. No. So then, why do these guys have websites that look like they're closed? Why do these guys have websites that don't have specials? Why are we not paying the attention necessary to the biggest investment we will make in our industry, right? I saw a, uh, a post on LinkedIn the other day about the uh, uh, About Us page, and I just laughed. And I replied back and said, About Us page, most of those are the same ones the website provider gave them three years ago. People don't go in and update it. People don't view the website that way. And it's still astounding to me. Here we are 15 years after I started an internet department, a full-on internet department, and we still have no idea how to run them. It's 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 amazing and frustrating all in the same breath. So best practices, focus on yourself, but don't worry so much about leads. Worry about processes. Worry about taking care of those leads and understanding that if, if less and less customers are submitting leads, then doesn't that mean the quality inevitably is going up? I mean, it... it, it, it 
it's something you have to sit and look at and say, okay, how many leads do I have? How many shows do I have? How many contacts on the leads do I have? People skip over the contact ratio. I don't mean how many people did you reach out to. Assumably, that's 100%. What I'm asking is, out of every 100 leads, how many people are you actually talking to? Having a meaningful discussion. Because if you have a contact problem, then that's not a show problem. And if you're having a show problem, that's not necessarily a contact problem and so on and so forth. And and then you've got to really decide where does it end for the stores with BDCs. That process should end at the show. BDC is not responsible for selling a car. So if any of you are out there still paying your BDC agents on a sold vehicle, knock it off. If any of you are out there judging your BDC agent on a sold vehicle, knock it off. They've got nothing to do with that. Yes, they can set the dealership up, but at the end of the day, the dealership and the personnel at the level dealing with the customer must close the car deal. So start being more engaged. Use the two ears you got. And the one mouth you've got to do more listening than anything else. And if you do that, the customer will inevitably show you how to sell them a car. It's old adage, but it still holds true to me. So you said you talk about spending on yourself first. So what do you what do you mean by that exactly? Invest in your website. I mean, you talk about content. Are you referring to um, just more, more sales? Uh, I mean, what, what are you talking about exactly? I mean, no, you're right. What? what Invest in yourself, Eric. What that means to me is making sure that your social media, right now, your social media is number one in your world. Um, It is the easiest way to get as local as possible. It is the easiest way to have a group of people who are into your message and follow your message. So taking care of yourself is making sure that your social properties are up to date. Your website is up to date. You've invested in search engine optimization for your website. Um, There's a big debate whether paid search is necessary. I'll tell you that it can be necessary. It can be used correctly. It can make a difference, but not nearly in the way people think it does, and certainly not at the budgets most people are spending it at. So when I talk about taking care of yourself, I'm talking about making sure the website specials are up to date, your staff page is up to date, your inventory is easy to get to with a minimal amount of clicks, guys. Data has told us in the past for every click, you lose 15% of your audience. So go back to your websites, click from your homepage all the way into a new car VDP. Tell me how many clicks it takes to get to the middle of a VDP. If it takes more than three, you have lost half your audience trying to get to your vehicle. Most importantly, make sure it's clear and concise. When you look at your websites, you have what we refer to as call to actions on your website. Get an e-price, make a phone call, text a friend, right? Make sure these things are clean. Some of these websites out here should have seizure warnings on them. You go onto these sites, all of a sudden there's a million callers, a million calls to action. I have no idea where to go. And I live in this business. I live on these websites and I still don't know what I'm doing. So clear, clear and simple, concise ways to go through the site and go through the inventory. The easier you make it for your customer to understand your way of doing business online, the easier it will be to sell that customer when they arrive at your dealership, assuming they don't even submit a lead. Remember, less than 15% of people will submit a lead. Here we are worrying about the exception when we should be worried about the rule. Okay, so listen here. I want to ask you a question for fun. Are you ready? I mean, take take your take your passion hat off for a second. <laughs> I, I want you to I, I want you to to remember back. I'm looking for your best sales story, bro. I, I, I want to tap into somehow. I want that that hidden little story that man I've only told three people in my life. Um, I, I want you to share what is your your best sales story that you've ever run across concerning you. All right. Um, so this is this is this is one I. I I actually, I don't even know that I've actually told in public. My friends know it. They've heard it. But I don't know that I've ever told in a public setting. So when I started in Chicago in the car business, um, it, one of the big things that were out there for sale um, were conversion vans. As a matter of fact, uh, Eric, I just told Tim Rowe this story on our uh, on our visit up to Green Bay last weekend. Um, so it, it's so here I am. I'm up front. I'm a, nut, I'm a young sales guy. It's later at night. I'm, I'm very excited for you know the opportunity to sell a car because I always sell them you know after six before nine type thing. Guy walks onto the lot, full on sweat pants. I mean, just it just couldn't have looked more like he was not interested in buying a car or even had money to do so. But I love the story already. Go ahead. Look, look, bro. You never judge a book by its cover, right? So I walk out there, 
full on, just kind of like, eh, what do I got here? You know, I walk out, I greet the guy. His name is Oleg, and and Oleg is uh, he's 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 a carpenter, and uh, he's got a, he's got an emerging business, and he wants to talk to me about getting his family a conversion van. All right, man. This is this is before SUVs were cool, man. Conversion vans were the thing, right? So, so but the coolest thing about a conversion van back in the day is is even if you knew where to go do research, which wasn't that easy, anyways. But even if you did, you were the sharpest, savviest guy out there. The only thing you could ever find out about a conversion van's true cost was just the shell of the truck, right? Just that white panel van that comes from the factory. That's all you could find. Base cost twenty eight grand. The rest of it was unknown to you unknown to you. And so I was able to get this guy into a vehicle. He wanted to do a different seat setup. I knew the conversion guy really well because I made that relationship happen um, early on in my career. So the conversion guy, uh, he says to me, Sean, we can switch out those seats and we can charge him like we're having the factory do it. But you and I can sit here on a Saturday night with you know a couple of beers and we can do it ourselves. So man, this is awesome. So now I can increase gross profit. This is really cool. So we go through, we switch this car out, we flip it back and forth, we do everything the guy wants, put it all together. We're talking, this is like a this is like a this I feel terrible saying this, but this is like a 20 G deal. Okay. Based on all things considered, the conversion van, the elements, seventy thousand dollar van, things were wild. I couldn't believe my eyes that this was happening. So here I am. I'm getting ready to close the deal. The guy is the guy. Couldn't be happier. He sees the van after we do all the the, the retrofitting. He's in. He is stoked. So I'm like, dude, this is awesome. See what I get for upping the guy in his sweatpants. I I, I didn't care about that. I moved past all that. Here I am. I've got a deal. This guy, and he loves us, right? And that's what you find, unfortunately, is the people that, that you tend to make the most money on, they got the best show, right? They got the, they didn't get the matinee. They got the 730 primetime edition of the selling show. And that's what I gave to this guy. Turns out that emerging carpentry business needed 10 more white panel vans for the business. I sold him 10 more vans over the next 90 days, man. We're talking this guy's gross gross profit to me was over $50,000 in 90 days. So my, my biggest point and takeaway was don't ever, 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 ever judge a customer, whether it's online, whether it's in person, whether it's via freaking Skype or text, don't judge them. They're all human beings. They all have how they expect to be approached. And as long as you're respectful and listen, it can turn into the best deal of your life. And I, I, I Oleg was a customer of mine. Even after I switched dealerships, the only reason I never did business with him again is because I actually moved out to Colorado and he had a Chicago based business. But other than that, I talk to Oleg almost every other week, just making sure he had whatever he needed because you never know when he might need something else. And it was just, it was one of those relations that I would have never had if I was old and kind of in my ways because I would have never gone out there on a cold November night in Chicago to up a guy in his sweatpants. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <laughs> hey, man, it's been awesome to have you on the show. Um, you know, uh, these conversations, you know, they just seem to fly by. But um, fly by, dude. Yeah, for sure. So there's one question I always ask. I always ask our guests, and that question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years, and why? Oh, Herb, you just told me you made it sound like you're wrapping up the show, and you asked me this question. Um, it, so here's the thing, man. Um, this is not going to be popular amongst people, um, but whatever you thought you experienced back in 2008, 2009, um, that's coming again. And it will be here within the next five years. Uh, the automotive downturn and, and, and downturn in general, unfortunately, is a part of the American habit. Um, I wish I could sit here and tell you that we were going to be able to overcome that. Uh, we're not. So if your business isn't already downturn proof or recession proof, uh, work your ass off to get it there. And I'm not here to scare you. I'm not here to fear monger you. I hate all that shit. That is not who I am as a human being. However, I am a human being who is prepared. I am a human being who sees the writing on the wall. And the more I worry, the more I hear people worry about, oh my God, the SAR number is going down. Used cars are this, new cars are that. Guys, pay attention. This is the reality, okay? Pay attention. Run your businesses like they're in a recession every day. Be tight with your money. Be smart with your processes. Where do I see this business in five years? It, 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 it's going to go back through the 08, 09. We're going to close more dealerships than we did last time. But when we're done with it, the actual model, the look of it is going to be different. 
There's so much going on with the subscription model, uh, ride share, et cetera. But don't forget, all these things still take cars and dealerships still have cars. Um, I think you'll see franchise laws change even more than they have now with the likes of Tesla and other people trying to do the same thing. Um, I think those are all going to be changes. But this idea that Amazon's coming or e-commerce and people are never going to leave their couches and have $50,000 cars delivered to their house is is something that's still only in the the the, the infant stages of things. It's still the, the 2%, the 3%. We still have to worry about the 98. Don't worry about millennials. They'll get tired of living in their parents' basement. They'll get tired of not having cars. They will get on board. We've all been through this. They thought the hippies were lazy in the 60s. You know, we thought they thought we were, we, they thought we were grunge kids in the 90s. It's all a part of, of people's perception. It will change. It will, it will evolve, but you must evolve with it, guys. We're already process wise we're behind the time but if i hear one more person tell me that the automotive industry is behind the time on digital marketing i will slap the taste out of your mouth that is completely incorrect i don't want to hear that anymore this industry sets the bar for digital marketing companies come to our industry to try out their products to see if they'll actually work at mass scale so don't don't let people tell you you're behind are you behind on how you handle leads treat customers Sure. But as it relates to spending your money, trying to be on the cutting edge, you're all there. But there isn't some next big technology curve in our business. We're already there. We've already hit it. There is not a magic bullet that will change your life on the digital side. There isn't a lead provider that will change your life tomorrow with 100 leads. It still comes down to people and process. And even more so, over the next five years, those will be the only thing that matters. And on top of that, Customer service will be the number one thing that matters to everyone because it's the one thing that will never change. Prices, how you go about it, all that stuff changes, but customer service, treating people with respect, listening to their needs, that will never change. Dude, I love that answer. I love what you said about digital. I think that uh, that's so thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, it's been awesome to have you on. I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to invite you to come back on. Would you come back on? Guys, of course I come back on. I love this. I love it. I'm all about it. If you have topics you want to talk about, if you want to just do this, whatever you guys want to do, you guys do a great show. You guys are in season two. I, of course, I'd love to come back. I love working with you guys. You are you are tremendous, tremendous gentlemen to, to, to consider my friends. And again, yes, absolutely. All right, right on, man. Thank you. Thank you so much, dude. Um, hey, can you uh, give the audience a, a way to get in touch with you? Yeah, man. You guys can all get a hold of me a couple different ways. Uh, you'll find me all over LinkedIn. That's Sean Welsh, S-E-A-N-W-E-L-S-H. You can email me directly, Sean, S-E-A-N, at CarBiz, done better. Uh, hell, you can text and call me right now after this show if you want, 262 262- Two seven eight zero one five seven, and uh, yeah, I'm the one that picks that phone up. That's really me. Um, so that's the that's the line I put out to everyone. That's all over my podcast, and uh, and, and more importantly, guys, you know, go go to YouTube, check out Car Biz Done Better. We've got a, a lot of content. We've got a podcast been running over there for over a year, um, and we we really love doing that. So please get engaged and uh, bring me all your thoughts. I love talking with people in our industry. Right on, and we'll definitely put a put a link on the notes to your show, uh, your contact information, all that stuff, so that the audience can get in touch with you and check your content out as well. So there it is, folks. Thanks again. Really appreciate having you on here. It's been a great conversation. And as usual, we'll talk later. So you made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much. Just want to remind everybody to go to the website at dealertalk.biz. Leave us your questions. Give us your feedback. We really appreciate it. And we'll talk later.